administrators for United Independent School District. But before that, we do want to recognize one of the board members for UISD who is with us this morning at this parent summit, and that is Mr. Frank Castillo. Good morning, everybody. Happy to be here with you. Buenos días a todos. Estoy muy alegre de estar aquí con ustedes. No quiero quitar ahorita a usted una persona que va a hablar muy bonito. We're going to have a very good speaker. And for that, I really appreciate what she's done for us, and I really thank her. Besides that, happy Veterans Day to all the veterans. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. Some of the administrators for UISD who are joining us this morning, uh, we want to start with one of the UISD administrators in charge, and that is the Assistant Superintendent for Administration and Policies, Rebecca Morales. She's down here on the floor. Also joining us is uh, the Associate Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Emma Lessa. And I'm not sure if he's here, but Hector Bettis, who is the Assistant Superintendent for Technology. Okay, for more on what we can expect for today and uh, more on uh, what this is all about, please uh, welcome the Executive Director for Federal and State Programs, Adriana P. Ramirez. Vamos, uh, hay comida para ustedes y luego a ese, a ese tiempo también tenemos muchos 
de premios que queremos dar. So, si uh, vienen y están aquí, ojalá que ganen. Um, in the agenda, también les dimos una agenda. Y la agenda, si ven, tiene un boleto abajo y también la, la información arriba. Hay un número arriba y abajo que corresponde el número. Cuando entren a las, en la tarde, a las 12, va a haber niños aquí con unas cajas, pueden cortar el boleto y por, lo ponen en la caja, se quedan con la parte de arriba porque eso va a ser la prueba. Uh, si llaman a su número, esa va a ser la prueba, ¿ok? Para que ganen. So, on, in your, we also have an agenda. It has two barcodes. So, please keep both portions. When you come back at 12.15, the body ticket, we'll put in the, in the box for, to, in the box of tickets, and you keep the top portion as your proof, so when they call out your number, and if you're the winner, you can show that, okay, for proof. You need to be present to win, so we want to see you back at 12.15, okay? At this time, I also want to take the opportunity to introduce our federal programs department, so with that, I have Ms. Uh, Sara Hernandez, our Federal Programs Coordinator. You can come up and join me. We have Ms. Roxanne Villagomez, our Parent Engagement Coordinator. And I, I also would like to have all of our, the rest of the coordinators and staff members that are here. You all can come up and join us, please. Come on, go to the front. We have Ms. Bella Gonzalez, who has taken the lead in all of the decorations that you see on stage and at the entrance and stuff, and we want to recognize her. This is not all of our department. We also have half of our department working in the back with the kids' cap, but it just gives me an opportunity to thank them because they have been doing a fantastic job of coordinating and working and just being so committed to making sure that we have everything that it takes for you today and really always all year long. So thank you all for the fantastic job that you all do. And like I said, this event is really not just our department, this really involves the entire district. We have curriculum and instruction, we have our police department, we have facilities, we have our technology department, everybody coming together, which is such a, makes such a wonderful event. And we thank everybody, we thank UISD for all of their support. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. And just to be clear, there will be no fun in Calvo. I was kidding, okay? So that's not what's for lunch. It is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her, and then we're going to show a video for you to watch. But our keynote speaker this morning is the Honorable Diana Saldana. She is a United States District Judge, and Judge Saldana was born in Carrizo Springs. She began her career, her legal career here in Laredo as a judicial law clerk to the Honorable George P. Kazin who was then Chief Judge for the Southern District of Texas. Now after her clerkship, Judge Saldana joined the U.S. Department of Justice as a trial attorney in the Employment Litigation Section of the Civil Rights Division in Washington, D.C. Thereafter, Judge Saldana joined a civil law firm in Houston. In 2001, she moved back to Laredo to serve as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Texas. She is now a United States District Judge for the Southern District of Texas here in Laredo. She was appointed to the position by President Barack Obama in February of 2011. Judge Saldana received a unanimous vote of 94 to nothing during her judicial confirmation proceedings. And at this time, I direct your attention to the screen for a video on the Honorable Diana Saldana, U.S. District Judge. Diana Saldana is a United States District Judge for the Southern District of Texas, Laredo Division. She was nominated for the position by President Barack Obama and was confirmed by the Senate in February 2011. We met with Judge Saldana at her chambers at the federal courthouse. We asked her to share with us her journey in life that led her to success. 
I was born and raised in Carrizo Springs, Texas, which is not far from Laredo, uh, an hour northwest of here. And I was born um, to Blanca Hernandez uh, Saldana and Rodolfo Saldana. Both of my parents um, grew up in farm worker families. They were both migrants. Both of them had that lifestyle, and so when they got married, it was kind of, um, you know, the next progression for them was that their family was going to be farm workers as well. Judge Saldana migrated alongside her family on a seasonal basis to work in the fields. I started working in the fields. The earliest that I can remember is when I was 10 years old. Me and I worked in the fields um, every year, every year from that, from that age until actually after my first year of law school. Judge Saldana vividly recalls the days she worked out in the field with her parents and siblings. She says the work was not easy and certainly no luxuries. Looking back on it now, I mean, it's hard for a, a young child, a young person who's trying to grow up and develop, you know, yourself and your personality and your self-esteem. And um, it was just hard uh, realizing that you were that poor and that people looked down at you and um, it kind of uh, makes you question your self-worth and makes you wonder what you're doing, you know, in the world and what's your role and what's going to be your future and um, because the work is very hard. It's hot and, you know, there's mosquitoes that are out, you get wet, you know, in the morning you get dry just by the virtue of the sun. Um, sometimes it's humid, sometimes you get rained on, there are no bathrooms. She says as farm workers, you learn to live and adjust to what you have. You have your hard times, but you must turn them into positives. You live in homes that nobody lives in during the year because they're just not livable. The best way to describe it is not losing hope uh, of a future. There are some things that we cannot change. There are, um, you know, like being a farm worker. If you're, especially if you're a kid, you can't change that if that's the life that your parents have uh, for you. So whatever you can change, work to change it. And if you cannot change it, make the best of it. The judge takes us through her academic track of success that led her to where she is today. I grew up working in the fields. My mother had a third grade education cannot read or write in the English language, cannot speak English very well. Um, you know, ended up raising six kids for the most part on her own. Um, you know, and I was able to graduate from high school. I was, and I was able to go on to college. And then I was able to go on to law school. Um, and then even on top of that, you know, I was able to go work for the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. I was able to work uh, at the attorney's office as a federal prosecutor. I became a magistrate judge, you know, at a very young age. I think I was 34 years old. And then I got this lifetime appointment at the age of 39. Judge Saldana always motivates and encourages students to stay on the right path. It's very important for all of the students at LISD to make the right choices. And the right choice is to stay in school, finish school, and you know, graduate from high school and you will make your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, the school, you will make them so proud. There are people there, there are counselors there at your school, you know, Dr. Nelson who cares about you. And if that is your dream, they will make sure that you have the resources that you need in order to uh, to attain your dreams. Judge Diana Saldana is living the American dream. I am from Carrizo Springs. You know, I grew up working in the fields. And, you know, if you want that, whatever you want, whatever dream you have, if you have a dream, don't let it go. Here I am, and this is the American dream. The Honorable Diana Saldana, United States District Judge, truly a success story.
puede, para todos se puede, para todos. Buenos días, buenos días a todos. Um, okay, do I have it on? Oh, sorry. Okay, now I was like, oh. Si se puede, si se puede, para todos, para todos, para todos. Si se puede, y si se puede, con Dios todo es posible, todo es posible. You know, sitting, standing here watching, every time I watch this video, I'm overwhelmed. Um, tengo 52 años, 52 años. Y todavía me acuerdo y todavía puedo sentir todo lo que sentía yo de niña. Todo ese deseo en mi corazón de querer hacer algo. Pero es querer hacer algo para ayudar a la gente. Porque yo veía muchas cosas de niñez, yo veía muchas cosas. La discriminación de los migrantes, uh, cómo nos veían uh, la gente cuando íbamos a Minisora y a Norticora. Todo esto me afectó a mí mucho, pero me afectó no negativamente, pero me dio mucho deseo de, de pelear, de luchar, de seguir adelante. Se so, vieron ahí un, un poquito de mi vida. Uh, uh, mi mamá era madre soltera, seis niños, uh, un hijo, cinco mujeres. Siempre nos decía que ella trabajó a las, a las hijas que las trabajó como hombres. Ella dice eso porque sí, uh, trabajamos mucho, trabajamos muy duro. Uh, pero todo eso, lo que dije en el video, uh, eso para mí, yo siempre cuando estaba trabajando, siempre preguntaba, pues, ¿qué va a pasar de mi vida? ¿Qué voy a hacer yo? ¿Qué estoy haciendo aquí? ¿Por qué estoy en esta vida? Y, y me hacía esas preguntas yo misma y yo uh, les, les urjo a ustedes como papás que les diga a sus hijos también que hagan esa pregunta que, que para ellos mismos que puedan a, a pensar qué es lo que estoy haciendo qué es lo que quiero hacer porque yo, yo creo con todo mi alma todo mi corazón que cada persona, cada niño, cada niña tienen un talento, tienen algo que le está llamando para servir, para servir nuestra comunidad, para ser, servir nuestro mundo. Y como papás, uh, nuestro trabajo es de ayudarlos, de ayudarlos a ver cómo pueden aprender qué es lo que uh, les está llamando a ellos. Porque cada persona si sí tiene ese talento, tiene algo que les va a poder uh, uh, a servir y, y es muy difícil, es muy difícil en este tiempo. Yo sé porque también soy madre, tengo cuatro hijos, uh, uno de 18 años, uno de 17 años, una de 11 años y una de 7 años. Uh, so yo uh, les voy a hablar un poquito de, de mi vida. Uh, ya vieron el video, eso fue toda mi niñez, uh, pero voy a hablar de lo que hago ahorita en mi trabajo y luego qué es de, lo que estoy haciendo yo para ayudar a nuestra comunidad también. So, les voy a hablar un poquito de inglés, un poquito de español. También quiero uh, alejar un tiempo para que ustedes me puedan hacer preguntas. Quiero que... que Uh, si tienen preguntas que me las pueden hacer, levanten la mano, ten tenemos un micrófono que se los pueden pasar. Si no quieren hacer la pregunta en el micrófono, lo pueden escribir, levantar un papel y alguien se los puede ir a levantar y me lo traen uh, porque quiero ser interactivo aquí, uh, porque aquí estoy para ayudarlos, para ayudarlos uh, como, uh, como papá, como mamá. Uh, porque yo quiero mucho a la juventud, es algo que me llama mucho a mí. Uh, pero déjame uh, tomar un poquito el agua. I'm going to switch back to English, although 
I'll switch back to English for a little bit. Um, I've gone around and I've talked a lot about my childhood. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to know, like, how are you successful? How were you able to, uh, to achieve these dreams? You know, I always tell them that I love to read. When I was growing up, and really it was my way to dream. When you grow up the way that I grew up with, you know, a lot of poverty, a lot of trauma, childhood trauma, you know, dream for me it was my escape. And so I encourage all of you as parents, um, you know, for me it was an escape, but it gave me the ability to dream. And I encourage you as parents to try to motivate your child to read. I can assure you that there are books, magazines, something that is going to interest your child. And if they have not uh, found a love of reading, they just haven't been exposed to the book that's going to call them, or to the magazine that's going to call them, the periodical that's going to call them. Because, you know, I, um, uh, I firmly believe that it will help you in so many different ways. Not just with your, you know, your PSAT, your SAT, your ACT, but, you know, writing skills, your vocabulary. And then also, you know, I just read an article where because of the kids always being on the phones and not really interacting with each other anymore, that it helps us really to continue uh, to have empathy and have compassion. If you're reading, you know, a story, a book, it, it, it helps develop those uh, skills that our kids, you know, desperately need. So I always talk about, uh, for me, that was one of the things as a child that I did. My favorite place was a library. Even today, I love going to libraries. It's just a very safe place for me. It's a very secure place for me. I love going. I love reading. I love exploring. Um, you know, there's just more books than there's time for me to be able to read. Um, and I've actually, as a little side note, you know, the summer readers that the kids get and, you know, the projects that they get, I try really hard to read those books. Um, as an adult, you know, they're, they're usually a, a fast read. You can get through it pretty quickly. And I talk to my kids about it. You know, I talk to my kids about the books that they've read, and I have noticed that it has created a whole nother um, aspect of the relationship that I have with my children. Being able to, to talk to them about the stories that they just read. Even the, you know, my first grader, you know, going over and reading with her and go, doing the stories that she's reading and talking to, it's just a whole nother level of intimacy with your child. Um, and it really, you know, I noticed it this past summer with my daughter, the, at that point she was 10, and she figured out that she loved to read, you know, novels and books about World War II history. And that just opened up a whole new level of a relationship with her. So uh, I highly encourage you to try and find the time, I know how hard it is, you know, when we're, life is just going by so fast, for you to try and find the time to read with your children and encourage them to read, you know, even the newspaper, the Laredo Morning Times, you know, pick up anything to just develop and to start those conversations, you know, because that's the other thing as a mother, you know, to be able to start these conversations with our children about what they're seeing, what they're reading, what they're hearing about, you know, trying to know what they're watching on, uh, you know, all of our kids are getting their news on TikTok or Instagram, you know, being able to understand what it is that they're seeing, what it is that they're reading, what it is that they're knowing, so that you can begin these tough conversations with our kids. You know, when I, here recently, uh, one other tidbit, I guess, about my childhood and growing up, um, you know, my daughter, the 11 year old recently had a really hard day at school and um, you know I was putting her to bed and she asked me do you ever feel like quitting you know do you ever feel like giving up and it was a very interesting question for her to ask me because it helped me to understand kind of how she felt um, and I thought about it and you know I told her 
No. Y no le dije que no. That was not an option for me. Esa no era opción para mí. No era opción. And uh, I told her, you know, the, the, the way that I was raised, and I hope the way that we're raising our kids, and that's really the, the, the real issue here, is to keep pushing through. To keep pushing through. That's what the issue is with our children, is that you cannot give up. That there's always a way. There's always a way to get around to where your goal is. And that's the importance of a dream. Because you have a dream and it's over there. It's at the other end of this cafeteria. The dream is over there. I don't know how I'm going to make it over there. I can walk this way. I can walk straight. I can go that way. I can zigzag. I could stop and have a conversation here for a little while. But eventually, I know the dream is over there, and I need to get over there. And so for us to try and figure out how do we help our children understand that there's a lot of different ways to get over there. So the first battle, the first issue, is that they have to have a dream. And that's the part where as parents, we've got to try and help them figure that out as parents. And then you've got an amazing school district here that wants to help support you in that journey and trying to help all of them have a dream. And so, you know, I told my daughter, I, it wasn't an option for me. That wasn't what I saw with my mother. You know, as she was working three jobs and trying to put food on the table and trying to be a mother and a father, and she kept telling us, ask questions. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to go to college. I don't know, you know, how you are gonna pay for it. But you need to ask questions. You need to ask questions, and if you don't know, and if you don't understand, ask more questions. And that's how she raised us. She raised us to be able to navigate, and any time there was a roadblock, to just work around it because the dream was over there. For me, the dream was to go to college. That was the dream. I was the first one in my family to graduate from college and that was the dream for me to get there. And then when I was in college, trying to figure out, and I worked full time. I had work study and I had a full time job. I worked full time and I went to school full time. And I did very well because I was focused, because I had the dream and nobody was going to be able to get me out of anything. I had the dream and it was going to be, it was all on me to figure out how to get to that dream. And then the dream was I'm going to go to law school. And then I had to figure that out. And I really wanted to go to UT. I graduated from UT from law school, but I did not get in the first time around. I went to a small college, a small law school in Minnesota. And I always tell kids, you know, I could have very easily, it's like a roadblock. It's, a, you know, oh, I didn't get into UT. Bueno, pues I guess I'm not going to be a lawyer. Bueno, pues ni modo. No, no, I, I didn't. It wasn't even an option. Pues I got into this school. Pues I guess I'm going to go to this school. That's where I'm going to go. And then I ended up making my way back to UT, which is very challenging and very difficult to do. But I worked really hard, and I was able to come back, and I graduated from UT. That's what I always tell these kids, like, there is a way. Don't lose sight. I could have very easily said, I'm not going to do it. Why don't you I'll give up. Let me go try and do something else. No, I had the dream, and I just went around it. And I ended up attaining my dream. And I, you know, I look back on my life, and there's so many things that I've gone through, and that I just know that the good Lord, you know, those experiences, um, my story, you know, for me to be able to be here and share it with you, and for me to be able to be here and to tell these children, you know, it doesn't always have to be that way. You know, think outside, open up, you know, your view. Don't be so narrow-minded in the way that you think things are going to go. So that's my childhood. That's kind of the way that I grew up, and it's in a nutshell. You know, I, I usually spend a lot of speeches talking about that journey. I don't want to do that today because there's so much more that I want to cover with you because I know you're all parents and you're all here early on a Saturday morning. Está lloviendo afuera. It'd be really nice to be at home drinking our cafecito, you know, con el frío. 
But no, we're all here because we care. We care about our children. Your children made you get out of bed and come through the traffic and end up over here. Well, there wasn't really any traffic coming over here, but the traffic here at the school, <laughs> right? Trying to find parking, y va a llover, no va a llover, you know, and to get inside and to brave, you know, the hallways here. But that desire, that love that each one of you has for your child or your children is what got you here. And I really applaud you. Like, look at this, we're full. I think we need to clap. I think we need to clap for all of you being here and making the time to, to just ask as many questions and to figure it out. All of these little breakout sessions are for you to help educate you so that you can then go home and help guide your child to figure out what that dream is and any time they deal with any adversity, ansiedad, los problemas que tienen, que, que van a seguir adelante, que van a seguir adelante, porque sí se puede hacer. So, mi, mi trabajo como jueza es algo muy difícil, porque la mayoría de lo que hago yo es a sentenciar a personas, es mandar a personas a la prisión. So, yo veo a las personas cuando están los más bajos en su vida. Están quebrados, están quebrados y es algo muy difícil, que me pesa y mucho. Uh, me saca toda la vida, toda mi energía, porque uh, lo siento. Lo siento cuando voy a sentenciar a alguien, yo sé que le estoy afectando a los padres. Si tienes hijos, tienen hijos a sus hijos, a hermanas, esposa, esposo, yo sé eso, yo sé lo que estoy haciendo y, y lo cargo mucho. Uh, yo veo uh, muchas cosas y las razones que gentes uh, quebran las leyes aquí, la mayoría, la mayoría de la gente es una cuestión de dinero, es cuestión de dinero, no son malos, no son mala gente. Uh, las otras personas que veo son personas que son adictos de la droga o personas que tienen problemas mentales y, y fueron a la droga. Es lo que veo, la mayoría. Sí tengo casos de gente que, que ya tienen mucho tiempo en ese camino y sí ya son uh, peligro a la comunidad. Sí tengo eso. Esas personas las ven más en, los esta, en el Estado. Yo, como Corte Federal, uh, la mayoría son uh, casos uh, crímenes, de, pero de droga, de droga, de armas, uh, dinero, pero todo eso, como les digo, la mayoría de la gente que está quebrando la ley en esas maneras son uh, personas que lo están haciendo por dinero, por dinero, porque no pueden uh, darle de comer a sus hijos, no pueden uh, pagar los biles, quizás quieren darles más cosas, quieren darles el más nuevo Apple iPhone, uh, o los juegos, o los tenis, I mean, el Louis Vuitton, el Gucci, you know, uh, Cinturón, todo eso, es lo que, cosas así, ¿verdad? Y luego los estoy sentenciando y sí son muy difíciles las, las, uh, las sentencias de prisión federal, sí es algo muy fuerte, es algo muy fuerte. So tengo ya 12 años de haciendo eso, 12 años. Y como les digo, he visto mucha gente, les puedo decir muchas historias de lo que yo veo. Y yo siempre tomo el tiempo de platicar con ellos, de conocerlos, a ver cómo están, para, des, para des, uh, hacer una decisión de qué tanto tiempo los tengo que mandar a la prisión. Y también pensando de ayudar, porque también queremos ayudar a las gentes que tienen problemas con drogas, a las, a las personas que tienen problemas uh, mentales, uh, So, todo eso, lo que, lo que yo he visto uh, 12 años como jueza uh, Distrito Federal y 5 años como magistrado, todo eso 
yo cada día me iba a la casa rezando, rezando como era, como, como lo hice de niñez, rezando, Diosito Santo, por favor, ayúdame. ¿Qué quieres lo que haga? Yo no puedo vivir mi vida mandando a gente a la prisión y no hacer algo. Por favor, yo soy tu instrumento. Yo quiero que me uses a mí, por favor. ¿Qué quieres lo que haga? ¿Qué quieres lo que haga? So, hice unas cosas. La primera cosa es que abrí un lugar ahí en la corte para ayudar a las personas que van a salir de la prisión. De ayudar con ropa, de ayudar con uh, cosas de, del baño, uh, para ayudar con uh, trabajo, para ayudar a agarrar su licencia. Hice esa cosa primero. Y luego pensé otra vez, rezando, pensando, eso no es suficiente. Eso no es, no va a resolver el problema. Ellos ya están aquí. Ellos ya se fueron del camino. ¿Qué más puedo hacer? Y Dios siempre me manda las respuestas. Siempre, siempre. Estoy rezando y me manda algo. Siempre. Y leí una, una historia de un programa que estaban haciendo en Boston, en la Corte Federal allá. Tienen ya más de 20 años que están haciendo ese programa en Boston. Y yo dije, lo tengo que hacer aquí en Laredo. ¿Por qué no en Laredo? ¿Por qué no? Sí, lo merecemos. Laredo también lo merece ese programa. So, empecé ese programa este verano pasado, fue el primer año. Seis semanas, estudiantes de la high school, de todas las escuelas públicas de Laredo. Escogemos 22 estudiantes que vinieron a la corte. Seis semanas estuvieron conmigo. Seis semanas para ayudarlos, para entrenarlos, para que, se, para que ellos puedan ser líderes en, ese, en sus escuelas y en la comunidad. Pero eso nomás empezó. Solamente empezamos. Es el Kaysen Fellowship Program. Y estoy muy orgullosa del programa. Fue algo uh, que, que fue muy bonito y me llenó a mí con más energía más energía para hacer más para nuestra comunidad y para nuestros hijos. So ya estoy empezando para empezar el, uh, el programa para el verano 20, 2024, pero antes de eso estoy tratando de formar un programa para Middle School y va a ser un Citizenship Academy para el Middle School y esos estudiantes que escogí del Kaysen Fellowship me van a ayudar a mí a empezar este programa y vamos a empezar el programa con el favor de Dios en enero. So, yo siempre estoy hablando con uh, todas, todas las escuelas, uh, con the administration de aquí, de United, uh, ISD, the administration from LISD, de todos, ahí estoy platicando, hablando y siempre les digo siempre me están apoyando. Siempre todo lo que les pido, todo lo que les digo, pues pienso que esto que piensan ustedes, mucho apoyo, porque tenemos el mismo uh, deseo, el mismo deseo todos de ayudar a nuestros hijos y hijas a ser líderes en esta comunidad. También la, la tercera cosa que estoy empezando es un programa que se llama el uh, Discovering Justice, es un Community Engagement Center. So es algo más para la comunidad. Again, to, to, to educate, to inspire, and to help our community be engaged citizens to be an engaged citizen. And it will be a location, and it will be open for the entire community, elementary, middle school, high schools, field trips, presentations, guest speakers, about our democracy, 
about the, the, the necessity to be a good citizen and what does it mean to be a good citizen. So those are my three uh, projects that I'm doing. Um, and again, it's just been this journey, right? It's been my journey, my childhood journey, my journey as a judge, everything that I've seen, and then a deep desire for me to then give back and to continue giving back and to use my job, you know, my job. I'm a federal judge. I have a lifetime appointment, a lifetime appointment for me to use that as a voice to help our community, to help elevate it, to help educate, to identify it, to help you. Because like I said, I'm not just a judge, I'm really a mother. I am a working mom. And let me tell you, that is the hardest job that you can ever have. And I see a lot of dads here, and thank you so much. We can't do it without the dads. But I think we need to give a round of applause to all the working mothers. Because I always tell my husband, you get to go to work, and you get to work your eight hours. I go to work, and I have to work my eight hours, but I also have to worry about after school, programs, extracurricular, doctor's appointments, medications, all of that. Throw all of that on me, too. And it is really overwhelming, and it is extremely tiring. And so I know, I feel you, believe me, and I have all the luxury in the world in the sense that I set my own schedule. Those of you who don't, throw that on top of that. A boss pounding at you, not being able to be out if your kids are sick, trying to figure out who's gonna take care of the kids if they're sick, having to not go to work and figuring out who's gonna pay uh, if you're not gonna get paid that day. I mean, it's really overwhelming. And I know, and I understand because I know I've seen what my mother's gone through, my sisters have gone through, you know, those who are not their own boss. I mean, I really am my own boss and I struggle. And I'm my own boss. I can't even, I can empathize. I have compassion for what, you know, the rest of you are doing who are not. I really do believe that we are fighting a battle for our children. This time that we are living in right now, this time that our children are living in right now, there's so much change. It's very different. This is what I was telling my daughter. I was like, you know, I was praying, and what do you, Lord, what do you want me to tell these parents? What do you want me to tell them? And I told my daughter, I was like, this is my prayer. And she said, well, how did you make it? Tell them, you know, the struggle and how did you succeed and how did you not give up? And I said, okay, I'm going to talk about that. But, you know, what else is more relevant? You know, because my life is really, yes, it's a great success story, but our kids can't really relate to that anymore. You know, and so I'm trying to figure out a way to, to get in there and to have it to where it's something that is relatable to them. So... You know, even my daughters, when we were in California and we were driving by and we saw all the farm workers working in the field, and I told her, I was like, Barbara, you're the exact age that I was when I was in the fields. Look at those people. And she would look, and I'm like, but do you understand? That was me. Yes. But I was like, but do you really get it? Like, I want you to feel the pain that I went through. Look, that was me. Okay, hombre. <laughs> Le dije, next summer we're going to go and I'm going to get you out there. That's what I told her. I was like, I'm going to come. Le dije a mi esposo, I'm going to come, I'm going to find family, I'm going to go back and work in the fields. And he's like, okay. I said, I'm going to do it a whole week. Okay. Maybe I'll do it a day. Se me hace que ya no puedo. Ya no puedo. Si se puede, ¿verdad? No, hombre, I won't be able to walk. Let me, let me give y'all some thoughts, um, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. And, oh my gosh, wait. When did I start? I don't even know what time it is. Did I, oh, where are we? I need to wrap it up. I need to wrap it up. That's why I told them I can talk so much. I have so much to tell y'all. I'm going to be here. If anybody has any questions and you want to ask questions, please come up. A couple of just quick thoughts in closing on just some suggestions. 
uh, for y'all as parents. And I know it's hard to set limits. Set limits. That's the whole, that's the hard job called parenting. It's draining, it's overwhelming, it's depressing. I know I live it. I tell my son, it would be so easy for me to give you a cell phone, give you a Nintendo Switch, give you a television, and put it all in your room. Oh my God, that would be so easy, I'd never see you. I think it would actually be kind of wonderful. I wouldn't have to deal with you, I wouldn't have to look at your face, all las caras que me hace. Como se está muriendo. I'm like, I wouldn't have to deal with any of it. But I love you. And so I can't do that because I know that's not the right thing to do. So give me your phone. You can't have a TV in your room. You have to go to bed at a certain time. No, you can't play the video game. No. That's hard. That's hard. And we got to do it. We got to do it. We got to do it. We got to set those limits. And I know they think that that phone, that they're gonna die without it. They really <laughs> honestly feel like if you take that phone away from them, they, I think they physically feel sick. <laughs> I think you all know what I'm talking about. Like they really, and they think they own it. They think that you have no right to have it and that it's theirs. And it's like, I'm gonna have a mental breakdown if you take my phone. <laughs> And they have had it. My sons have had mental breakdowns when I've taken it away from them. So I know, I've lived it. But we need to give, we need to. We need to set a limit. We need to encourage them to actually have real interactions with human beings, not just on the phone. And not to get everything off of the phone. Like to really go out and be involved in these groups, these organizations, these clubs, these UILs, but to be the, to develop those social skills because our kids went through COVID. They didn't have those three years. They missed out. So I encourage you to set limits, to help them become productive. I also want to tell you, as I tell you to set limits, the goal is independence, right? So we can be a helicopter parent. I was one. It was horrible, it was the worst thing I could have ever done. I think I really messed up my older kids because of that. Um, but the goal is independence. So then it's like you're trying to navigate that. You're setting limits, but we also need to make sure that when they leave, that they're not gonna get in trouble. That they know how to follow the rules, that they know how to follow the laws, that they know how to set limits on themselves. That's the other part of it. Set limits, but just know your goal is to get them out. Your goal is to get them out in a safe way, to be able to make good decisions when you're not watching and you're not setting the limits. And as they get closer to graduating, if you know they have not acquired those skills of how to set limits on themselves, for you to be able to say, you know what, it's okay. You don't need to go. Why don't we stay here a little bit longer so I can keep an eye on you and make sure you don't get yourself in trouble. And that's what I had to do with my older boy. And he knew it. He had to, he's like, yeah, you're right. I was like, you would be playing video games like 24 hours a day. You would not go to school. You wouldn't go to class. And he's like, yeah, you're right. Why don't we just stay here? Stay in Laredo. Get a job. Let's wait until we mature a little bit. And then we can think about you going to college. So knowing your child, knowing your child, and then having faith in them, trusting them. The goal is for them to be independent. High expectations. That's the other thing that's hard parenting. I tell my daughter, you know, I know you can do more. I know you can, and I know that it's gonna require a little bit more effort. But I promise you, this isn't even about this test. It's about you as a person. It's about your character. What kind of person are you gonna be when things are hard and things get tough and you have fear and you have anxiety? Is it gonna paralyze you and you can't move? Or are you gonna push through? 
So this, it's not really about this test, it's not really about this class, it's not really about this lesson, it's about a lot, it's a bigger picture. Who are you gonna be? What kind of person are you gonna be? And I want you to push through. Because every single one of our kids, we already all know it, the world is different and everything is gonna be challenging and only God knows what's coming. Only God knows what's coming. As we go through all of the changes in our political system with our leaders, we don't know, so we've got to prepare our kids. We have to. It is urgent that we do so. And then the last thing that I want to tell you is for you to reach out to the teachers, the counselors, ask questions the way that my mother would tell us to. I can tell you there are people here who want to help you. Laredo is a unique and beautiful place. I, I love Laredo con todo mi corazón because we have good people here. We have people who want to help. There are so many different opportunities for your children. All you need to do is find the right person to ask and then they're gonna help you figure it out. So ask questions and keep on doing that. My mother empowered me as a child and I want each one of you to know that each one of you has the ability to empower your child. Empowerment, the ability to do that for somebody, it does not require that you do it in the English language. It does not require that you have a high school diploma. It does not require that you have a college diploma. It doesn't require that you are a reader and that you love to read. You don't need any of that. I'm telling you right now, my mother had a third grade education. She could not read or write in the English language. She could not speak English very well, and she empowered me. Each one of you has the ability to do that for your child. And I am here to help you. My goal is to help. I see that as I've kind of gone through my journey, and I'm, you know, I still have another 15 years on the bench uh, before I can take senior status. And I see just this flip. I mean, where I'm spending more time with the educators, and I know all of them, and the administrators, and they, I have them all on my cell phone, and they have my cell number. And I'm excited. I am excited about this journey with all of you. And so I'm really grateful and I'm thankful that they invited me to come and be here uh, with you today. I know a lot of times they bring people in from out of town. This time they brought a lot of the women here. And thank you so much. God bless all of you. Thank you.